Okay, so this is going to be a quick talk on the three different renal tubular acidoses that are tested on the USMLE. So some principles of the renal tubular acidoses in common is that they are all disorders or dysfunctions of the channels of the nephron, what they call in cell biology a channelopathy. Uh, this is another good reason why it's really useful to understand the different channels of the nephron and where they are and how they work and uh, which channels reabsorb what and which channels secrete what. Uh, there's three different types of renal tubular acidoses, like I mentioned. They're 1, 2, and 4. 3 is a mixed type, and it's very difficult to diagnose, and generally USMLE Step 2 and 3 do not test uh, uh, type 3 renal tubular acidosis. There's various presentations of renal tubular acidosis depending on which one it is, but what they do have in common is that they're going to be a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So you, it is a metabolic acidosis and that your blood pH is going to be less than 7.35 and you're going to have a low serum bicarbonate and it's a normal anion gap and that your anion gap is less than 10. The important labs to have here are, of course, the blood pH. You're going to want to have your complete metabolic profile, particularly your potassium level, your bicarb level, and you're going to want, in any uh, metabolic acidosis, you're going to want to have your anion gap calculated. Uh, for urine, it's good to have, it's critical to have the urinary pH, and it may be useful to calculate your urinary anion gap, which is calculated the exact same way that you calculate your serum anion gap. It's just your sodium plus your potassium in your urine minus your chlorine, chloride in your urine. So calculate the same way. So these are the three types of renal tubular acidosis. Type 1 affects a distal channel, type 2 affects a proximal channel, and type 4 affects the channels that are affected by allosterone. So these are the three types. Uh, the way that we're going to distinguish the two is by serum potassium and urinary pH. So as you can see, all three of these have different profiles. So type 1 affects the hydrogen potassium pump, and uh, that's going to be a low serum potassium and a high urinary pH. Type 2 affects the serum bicarb, uh, or the, uh, the proximal convoluted tubule bicarb sodium reabsorber and that's going to cause a low serum potassium and a low urinary pH. And then your type 4 is uh, implicated by the aldosterone mediated channels and that will have a high serum potassium which makes sense because basically what type 4 is is a mimicry of, of low aldosterone or anything that causes low aldosterone and remember what does aldosterone do? It increases your absorption of sodium by the expense of potassium. So if you have low aldosterone, your serum potassium is going to be high and your urinary pH is going to be low because if you have a high potassium in your filtrate, then this channel here, your hydrogen potassium pump, is going to be uh, increased in activity. And so what happens then is you're going to have potassium being reabsorbed and hydrogen being excreted. So that's, that's why you get uh, this profile in your type 4. We'll talk about each of these individually. So we'll start out by type 1 RTA and this is the hydrogen potassium pump that we just talked about right here. Uh, this pump here is defected. So if this pump here is defected, what can you imagine happens? Well, we can't pull hydrogen ions out of our blood and we can't reabsorb potassium ions. So naturally, if we can't, if we can't pull out hydrogen ions from our blood, then we're going to have acidemia. We're going to have a metabolic acidosis because we've got all these hydrogen ions sitting in the blood. If we can't reabsorb potassium, then we're not going to get potassium back into our blood, so we're going to have hypokalemia. So that right there explains the hypokalemia and the acidosis. Right there, as long as you know that the hydrogen potassium pump is defected in type 1 RTA, then you know you've got a hypokalemia and a metabolic acidosis. Now, why is the urine, ba uh, why is the urine basic in RTA? Because you would think if you have acidemia, your urine should be acidic too. Well, look at this. When you have type 1 RTA, you can't pull hydrogen into your urine from the blood. And so because you can't acidify your urine, that's going to cause the urine to be basic. And so you're going to have an acidemia 
and a basic urine. And you're going to have, uh, because you can't pull potassium out of your urine into your blood, you're going to have a hypokalemia. So in other words, you've got hypokalemia, acidosis, and basic urine, and that will help you diagnose your type 1 RTA. These patients tend to have a history of chronic kidney stones, and why is that? Well, their urine is basic. A basic urine is going to increase your formation of calcium kidney stones. So these patients will usually have a history of nephrolithiasis. The cause of type 1 RTA, not usually tested on the USMLE, uh, but good to know some of the associations of type 1 RTA. Usually it's idiopathic, but they can be associated with autoimmune disorders, particularly Sjogren's, Sjogren's syndrome. It can be associated with chronic hepatitis and drugs, particularly amphotericin or lithium. The way we diagnose this is simply by administering ammonium chloride to the patient. What would we expect in a normal patient? Well, ammonium chloride is acidic. So ammonium chloride is NH4Cl. It carries that proton. And so when we give a patient acid, we would expect their urinary pH to drop. Well, in type 1 RTA, because they can't acidify their urine right here, they're not going to be able to pull those extra protons from that ammonium chloride. And so they'll, have, they'll continue to have acidemia, but their, but their urine pH is going to continue to be basic. It's going to be high. So giving them an acid load challenge with ammonium chloride and them continuing to have a high urinary pH is diagnostic for type 1 RTA. Another way you can diagnose this, uh, the way you can imagine it, is that they're going to have a low ammonium chloride in their, in their uh, urine. That makes sense because they're not acidifying their urine. And so they're going to have a very high urinary anion gap. Their sodium and potassium will be fine in their urine, but their chlorine will be low. And so you'll have a positive urine anion gap. So a uh, ammonium chloride challenge with a basic urine or a positive urine anion gap are two ways to diagnose type 1 RTA. And the way we treat this is simply by giving the patient their bicarbonate and their potassium that uh, need to be replaced. So because they have acidosis, they'll benefit from the PO bicarb. And because they have the hypokalemia, they'll benefit from the PO uh, potassium. Of course, if their potassium is severely low, uh, when they come in, you should get an EKG because you want to make sure uh, that this isn't an emergent situation. So moving on to the type 2 RTA. So what happens here is that the sodium bicarb reabsorption channel in the proximal convoluted tubule is defected. And so because you can't reabsorb bicarb, uh, the kidney is going to just waste the bicarb out, and this is going to cause a metabolic acidosis because normally in the proximal tubule, we should be reabsorbing bicarb. And so because we can't reabsorb bicarb, we're going to have a high urinary bicarb and uh, a low reabsorption of bicarb, which is going to cause acidemia. So even though we're going to have a uh, a high urinary bicarb, because the rest of the nephron works, the urine will still have time to acidify. So you will have a basic urine here, but the rest of this nephron is going to work perfectly fine. And so you will be able to acidify your urine. Remember, you still have a metabolic acidosis. So your body's still going to want to get rid of those, of those hydrogen ions. So because this isn't a distal, this is a proximal renal tubular acidosis, the rest of the nephron is going to work fine. So you are going to get rid of, of the hydrogen. And so in this case, you're not going to have as severe of an acidemia because your blood is still going to be able to get rid of the hydrogen ions, but you're going to also have a, high, or a low urinary pH because you're getting rid of those hydrogen ions. Now remember that we do have an acidic urine. And so, what's the first place we get rid of the uh, we get rid of the hydrogen? Well, it's going to be right here. And so, what happens is, whoops, go back here. The hydrogen sodium and the sodium potassium ATPase are going to be highly activated. Okay, so we're going to have a highly activated. These two channels are going to be very highly activated. Uh, 
Uh, and the reason uh, being is because uh, we have a uh, acidic filtrate. So because we have uh, an acidic filtrate here, we're going to be reabsorbing uh, hydrogen, and this is going to cause the ultimately cause the secretion of potassium. So we reabsorb hydrogen, we're going to uh, secrete sodium, and then the sodium potassium ATPase, we're going to reabsorb that sodium and secrete the potassium. So potassium ultimately goes out of the urine. That causes the hypokalemia. So the best way to think about this is that you have a hypokalemia, a basic, oh, sorry, that's type 1. Uh, so the best way to think about type 2 is that you have a hypokalemia, an acidic urine, and acidosis. So type 1, you have a hypokalemia with a basic urine. Type 2, you have a hypokalemia with an acidic urine. Type 2 RTA is associated with rickets and osteomalacia, unlike type 1, which is associated with uh, with chronic kidney stones. And the, cause, the causes are similar to type 1, uh, but in addition, heavy metal exposure can cause type 2 renal tubular acidosis, as well as acetazolamide, which, remember, is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which also works as a diuretic. The way to diagnosis is quite simple. You just get your fractional excretion of bicarbonate. That's just a special test, and all it does is it measures the amount of bicarb that's coming out of the urine. So remember, if we're not reabsorbing bicarb, it's going to come out in the urine. So you'll have a high urinary bicarb, a high fractional excretion of bicarbonate. So if the fractional excretion of bicarb is high, as well as they fit a urine, an acidic urine and a hypokalemia and a metabolic acidosis, that's all going to point towards type 2 renal tubular acidosis. The way we treat this is uh, by thiazide diuretics, with, like furosemide. And the reason is, I don't know why, but thiazide diuretics reduce urinary bicarb. It, increases your reabsorption of bicarbonate. So thiazide diuretics are good. You're just going to have to memorize that. I don't know what the mechanism is. Uh, I'm not sure we even really know what the mechanism is, but thiazide diuretics will allow us to uh, uh, increase our reabsorption of bicarbonate, which is the problem here. Uh, you're also going to want to give them high-dose PO bicarb and a potassium supplement. So unlike type 1 RTA, where we just give them PO bicarb and PO potassium replacement, in type 2 RTA, we want to add a thiazide diuretic. Okay, so type 4 RTA is the uh, hypoaldosterone RTA. And so basically what causes this is anything that causes low aldosterone. So it could be Addison's disease, it could be uh, renal failure, anything that causes a low aldosterone state. So if you have low aldosterone, you're going to have more sodium in your blood or in your filtrate and a higher potassium in your blood. And of course, if there's a higher potassium in your blood, then the sodium potassium or sorry, the uh, the hydrogen potassium pump is going to be uh, is going to be slower. So you have more potassium in your blood, this pump is going to work slower because you already have a high potassium in your blood, and so you're going to have uh, a high or a low urinary pH. Uh, so hydrogen is going to stay in the blood, um, and uh, like I said, anything consistent with hypoaldosteronemia uh, would be a symptom of type 4 RTA. Uh, this is associated with diabetes mellitus, and the way you diagnose this is just to get a, an aldosterone level on these patients. And the treatment is simply fludrocortisone, which has an aldosterone mimicry activity, and that will correct the symptoms related to the low aldosterone, and it will also treat the hyperkalemia and the acidosis. So reviewing here, the renal tubular acidoses, they're all going to give you a patient with a blood pH of less than 7.35, a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Type 1 RTA is a defect of the hydrogen pump in the intercalated cell of the collecting duct. So what happens here is we cannot excrete hydrogen. Because we can't excrete hydrogen, we can't acidify the urine. Because we can't acidify the urine, you're left with a basic urine. So the urine pH will be high. Uh, because we have a basic urine, these patients are going to be at risk for 
chronic nephrolithiasis because they have a basic urine. It makes it much easier to form calcium phosphate stones. The serum potassium is going to be low. Uh, the reason for that is that because you're not excreting hydrogen, you're going to have a relatively negative charge, a more negative charge on your, uh, you're going to have more negative charge in your filtrate. And so that's going to keep the potassium in the filtrate. And so you're not reabsorbing potassium. So that results in potassium wasting and therefore a low serum potassium. The treatment for type 1 is PO bicarb and PO potassium replacement. Type 2 is a defect of the bicarb channel in the proximal convoluted tubule. In this case, we cannot reabsorb bicarbonate. So what happens with type 2 RTA is that you start out with a basic urine because what's happening is that you're getting rid of all your bicarb. So you're peeing out a ton of bicarb. That's going to make your urine basic for a little while. Ultimately, what happens, though, is that the urine pH will drop because you'll run out of bicarb. And as you run out of bicarb, then uh, your urine pH will drop because you no longer have the bicarb to excrete. So the urine pH ultimately will be low. Uh, the serum potassium will be low as well because we have a negative charge in the, uh, with the excess bicarb in the filtrate. So with that excess bicarb in the filtrate, you hold on to potassium and therefore you have reduced, reabs uh, reduced reabsorption of potassium. So you have a low uh, serum potassium. The symptoms here can be osteomalacia and rickets. The treatment is a loop diuretic, PO bicarb, and PO potassium replacement. Type 4 RTA is just a deficiency of renin or aldosterone. Uh, so this is going to affect all of the channels that aldosterone affects. So uh, namely, it's going to be that ENAC channel in the principal cell. So remember that ENAC absorbs sodium and that positive charge uh, is going to drive the potassium out of the cell. So if we don't have the reabsorption of sodium, we retain the potassium inside the cell and thus we'll be able to reabsorb the potassium. So it works the opposite way of aldosterone. Remember what aldosterone does. Aldosterone helps you reabsorb sodium at the expense of potassium. If you don't have enough aldosterone, if you're deficient in aldosterone, then you're going to pee out sodium and maintain your potassium. So the serum potassium will be high. The urinary pH is going to be low in this case. And then uh, you can have low blood pressure, diabetes mellitus, salt craving, as you would expect to have in a low aldosterone state. And the treatment is fludrocortisone. RD, uh, RTA type 4, you can also see a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis.